Hello there. I'm Rosemary Robertson, Chief Science Officer of the American Heart Association, and we're here at the European Society of Cardiology. I've been lucky to capture our past president, immediate past president, Donna Arnett, who's here with me, uh, to talk about some of the uh, studies that have been that have been discussed here today, uh, and in particular to focus on uh, risk factors. We'll talk a little bit about two studies that were done in uh, diabetic patients and uh, talk as well about HDL. And we've been thinking a lot about HDL uh, over the past several years as to whether uh, it is a viable target uh, or whether it's just a marker of risk and uh, we'll give you the, the latest on that as well. So Donna, two studies on diabetes here, quite interesting, two new, uh, two new drugs, uh, DPP-4 uh, inhibitors, and a question as to whether cardiologists should use those. So we've got, uh, should we take them one at a time? We've sure. got, uh, we've got Saver, mm -hmm. uh, Timmy 53 now. Yes. Uh, just a long line of Timmy studies. Uh, and uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what they found there and what they were looking at? So this saxagliptin is, a, mm -hmm. is one of the newer agents and they were in a very large group of people really asking the question about non-inferiority versus placebo mm -hmm. um, and they were examining whether there was any uh, associated risk for cardiovascular disease in this very large group of diabetics. Mm. And, that, and that's been an important question because as we know from previous studies sometimes drugs that do a great job uh, with, uh, with glycemic control can either lead to increased cardiovascular risk or at least not seem to help with cardiovascular risk. So these were, this was a group of patients who had a lot of risk factors for coronary disease. Some had coronary disease and uh, assessing the effect in those patients is a particularly interesting group to look at. Right, this was a group, uh, about a third had cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease and the other two thirds really a lot of risk factors mm -hmm. and they were well controlled in terms of many of those risk factors. So here they were testing the question of adding this drug versus placebo, did you have any uh, harm associated mm -hmm. with cardiovascular disease? And the answer is no harm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there, it was in the context of, of their primary outcome, which was a combined stroke, cardiovascular disease, uh, and fatal uh, MI. Right. So, so with adding this drug, they did manage to lower the hemoglobin A1C. Absolutely. But it wasn't terrible to begin with. They were at a level of about eight, uh, as I recall. Right, they were fairly well controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what, what's interesting is that they did show a benefit in terms of microalbumin. So the right. microvascular disease appears to be better. Uh, but there was this one signal that seems to be of concern, which was an increase in heart failure hospitalizations mm -hmm. uh, amongst those randomized to the active agent. So, uh, so let's see, we, we've got a benefit on microvascular disease probably uh, with a decrease in microalbuminuria over the course of two years, is that right? Right. And we don't have a benefit, we don't have a major risk uh, in terms of the pre-specified endpoints for cardiovascular disease, so maybe not a drug that we're using that we would add to say we're going to keep you you know out of the hospital with cardiovascular disease keep you from having a heart attack we're really not thinking that it's an improvement in macrovascular disease and and that's obviously important to cardiologists and other people treating patients with coronary disease and, and it's really when you come to the choice of you know metformin's a great drug it's been right. around a and, long and time first line choice first line drug for people with type 2 diabetes and here we're talking about what's the next drug to add, right. is there a reason to add this drug? Uh, it's, it's like no harm, no foul. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, mm -hmm. it appears to not increase risk uh, mm -hmm. and may have this benefit in micro, microvascular disease. Right, right. So you get your hemoglobin A1C down to 7.5 mm -hmm. from 8, uh, a clear benefit, and then, uh, and then we just have to keep an eye, we think, on this question of whether this turns out to be real, this issue of uh, hospitalizations for heart failure, that might or might not continue to be true in other studies. Right. Okay. So, uh, so then we turn to the other study. So the, the other study was examined. Right. And now we are looking uh, uh, at patients with, again, patients with diabetes mm -hmm. and looking at another, again, adding a drug to pretty good diabetes control right. and looking to see if there is either a signal for harm or a signal for benefit. 
And again, we find uh, no signal for harm. Uh, and here we uh, also had no real um, signal of benefit in terms mm -hmm. of, of, you know, glycemia was well controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that case, uh, a, a good a good product, but no a, a, no increased risk of cardiovascular disease, um, but also no benefit mm -hmm. cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. And so. we don't have quite the detail on. Uh, you know, on the uh, on the longer term outcomes of microvascular disease, right. but we'd assume that if we, in fact, uh, improve glycemic control, we'd expect those. Have right. to see how that uh, how that turns out in the long run. But uh, but again, if you're looking for the next line drug, it's not clear this is a, a home run. And I think for cardiologists or internists out there seeing patients, you know, it's it's probably not going to have a huge impact yet on clinical practice. Yeah, I would think that's probably right. So. Uh, the other, uh, the other area that was looked at here today was the area of lipids and uh, the ASSURE study that, uh, that again was a different approach to HDL. So we've seen studies over the past several years saying, uh, you know, CETP inhibitors, if you can, even if you can improve uh, uh, HDL levels, you don't necessarily uh, get a benefit out of that and you can have harm, perhaps because of off-target effects. Uh, this is a little bit of a different take. It was a different take. This was a drug that is used to uh, increase APOA1, mm -hmm. which of course should have a benefit on HDL. And the target was symptomatic coronary disease patients, mm -hmm. and they were um, with low HDL at entry. Interestingly, uh, both the placebo group and the APOA1 uh, uh, group uh, showed benefit in terms of their lipids. Um, yes, I thought it was remarkable, uh, in fact, how much benefit there was. So, so my assumption is that being in this study was really good for these patients it because, <laughs> uh, you know, I think they must have been very optimally, optimally managed from uh, from every other perspective. Right. They were. Interestingly, their primary out, out, outcome was looking at intravascular coronary um, mm -hmm. um, and looking at the plaque within the, the coronaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was really no statistically significant difference in a number of those measures of plaque volume. Right, right. Intravascular ultrasound, a uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's a uh, it's a nice hard endpoint, but uh, also hard to you know you, to show a benefit. Uh, you've got to have a real benefit, and uh, and I think here they didn't meet that statistical they barrier. They didn't. They didn't. It was a small, relatively small study, though, with uh, just about 240 patients in the active treatment group and 80 right. in the placebo group. So right. I think the bottom line for that one is less stay tuned, and we. We love to keep the HDL hypothesis going. Right. Thanks so much, Donna. Terrific, uh, terrific uh, uh, studies. Well done. Uh, you know, really carefully controlled patient groups, and uh, but probably not changing uh, changing practice. Uh, not changing practice anytime soon here. Not not from any of these studies. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rose.